Chapter Eight of the Doings of Raffles Haw by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Billionaire's Plans. That morning's and many mornings, both before and afterwards, were spent by Laura at the new hall, examining the treasures of the museum, playing with the thousand costly toys which Raffles Haw had collected or sallying out from the smoking-room in the crystal chamber into the long line of luxurious hothouses. Haw would walk demurely beside her as she flitted from one thing to another like a butterfly among flowers, watching her out of the corner of his eyes and taking a quiet pleasure in her delight. The only joy which his costly possessions had ever brought him was that which came from the entertainment of others. By this time his attention towards Laura McIntyre had become so marked that they could hardly be mistaken. He visibly brightened in her presence, and was never weary of devising a thousand methods of surprising and pleasing her. Every morning, ere the McIntyre family were afoot, a great bouquet of strange and beautiful flowers was brought down by a footman from the hall to brighten their breakfast-table. Her slightest wish, however fantastic, was instantly satisfied if human money or ingenuity could do it. When the frost lasted, a stream was dammed, and turned from its course that it might flood two meadows, solely in order that she might have a place upon which to skate. With the thaw there came a groom every afternoon with a sleek and beautiful mare, in case Mrs. McIntyre should care to ride. Everything went to show that she had made a conquest of the recluse of the new hall. And she, on her side, played her part admirably, with female adaptedness she fell in with his humour, and looked at the world through his eyes. Her talk was of almshouses and free libraries, of charities and of improvements. He had never a scheme to which she could not add some detail, making it more complete and more effective. To Haw it seemed that at last he had met a mind which was in absolute affinity with his own. Here was a helpmate, who could not only follow, but even lead him in the path which he had chosen. Neither Robert nor his father could fail to see what was going forward, but to the latter nothing could be possibly more acceptable than a family tie which should connect him, however indirectly, with a man of vast fortune. The glamour of the gold bags had crept over Robert also, and froze the remonstrance upon his lips. It was very pleasant to have the handling of all this wealth, even as a mere agent. And why should he do or say what might disturb their present happy relations? It was his sister's business, not his, and as to Hector Spurling, he must take his chance as other men did. It was obviously best not to move one way or another in the matter. But to Robert himself, his work and his surroundings were becoming more and more irksome. His joy in his art had become less keen since he had known Raffles Haw. It seemed so hard to toll and slave to earn such a trifling sum when money could really be had for the asking. It was true that he had asked for none, but large sums were forever passing through his hands for those who were needy, and if he were needy himself, his friend would surely not grudge him. So the Roman galleys still remained faintly outlined upon the great canvas. While Robert's days were spent either in the luxurious library at the hall, or in strolling about the country, listening to tales of trouble, and returning like a tweed-suited ministering angel to carry Raffles Haw's help to the unfortunate. It was not an ambitious life, but it was one which was very congenial to his weak and easy-going nature. Robert had observed that fits of depression had frequently come upon the millionaire, and it had sometimes struck him that the enormous sums which he spent had possibly made a serious inroad into his capital, and that his mind was troubled as to the future. His abstracted manner, his clouded brow, and his bent head all spoke of a soul which was weighed down with care it was only in Laura's presence that he could throw off the load of his secret trouble. For five hours a day he buried himself in the laboratory, and amused himself with his hobby, but it was one of his whims that no one, neither any of his servants, nor even Laura or Robert, should never cross the threshold of that outlying building. Day after day he vanished into it, to appear hours afterwards pale and exhausted, while the whir of machinery and the smoke which streamed from his high chimney showed how considerable were the operations which he undertook single-handed. "'Could I not assist you in any way?' suggested Robert, as they sat together after luncheon in the smoking-room. "'I am convinced that you overtry your strength. I should be glad to help you, and I know a little of chemistry.' "'Do you indeed?' said Raffleshaw, raising his eyebrow. 
I had no idea of that. It is very seldom that the artistic and the scientific faculties go together. I don't know that I have either particularly developed, but I have taken classes, and I worked for two years in the laboratory at Sir Josiah Mason's Institute. I am delighted to hear it, Hall replied with emphasis. That may be of great importance to us. It is very possible, indeed almost certain, that I shall avail myself of your offer of assistance, and teach you something of my chemical methods, which I may say differ considerably from those of the orthodox school. The time, however, is hardly ripe for that. What is it, Jones? A note, sir. The butler handed it in upon a silver salver. Ha! broke the seal and ran his eyes over it. Tut, tut! It is from Lady Morsley asking me to the lord lieutenant's ball i cannot possibly accept it is very kind of them but i do wish they would leave me alone very well jones i shall write do you know robert i am often very unhappy he frequently called the artist by his christian name especially in his more confidential moments i have sometimes feared that you were said the other sympathetically but how strange it seems you are yet young healthy with every faculty of enjoyment and a millionaire. Ah, Robert, cried Haw, leaning back in his chair, and sending up thick blue wreaths from his pipe. You have put your finger upon my trouble. If I were a millionaire, I might be happy, but alas, I am no millionaire. Good heavens, cried Robert. Cold seemed to shoot to his inmost soul as it flashed upon him that this was a prelude to a confession of impending bankruptcy, and that all this glorious life, all the excitement and the color and change, were about to vanish into thin air. No, no millionaire, he stammered. No, Robert, I'm a billionaire, perhaps the only one in the world. That is what is on my mind, and why I am unhappy sometimes. I feel that I should spend this money, that I should put it in circulation, and yet it is so hard to do it without failing to do good, without doing positive harm. I feel my responsibility deeply. It weighs me down. Am I justified in continuing to live this quiet life when there are so many billions who I could save and comfort if I could but reach them? Robert heaved a long sigh of relief. Perhaps you take too grave a view of your responsibilities, he said. Everyone knows that the good which you have done is immense. What more could you desire if you really wish to extend your benevolence further? There are organized charities everywhere which would be very glad of your help. I have the names of two hundred and seventy of them, Ha answered. You must run your eye over them some time and see if you can suggest any others. I send my annual mite to each of them. I don't think there is much room for expansion in that direction. Well, really, you have done your share, and more than your share. I would settle down to lead a happy life and think no more of the matter. I cannot do that, Ha answered earnestly. I have not been singled out to wield this immense power simply in order that I might lead a happy life. I can never believe that. Now can you not use your imagination, Robert, and devise methods by which a man who has command of, well, let us say, for, for argument's sake, boundless wealth, could benefit mankind by it without taking away what anyone's independence or in any way doing harm? Well, really, now that I come to think of it, it is a very difficult problem, said Robert. Now, I will submit a few schemes to you, and you may give me your opinion on them. Supposing that such a man were to buy ten square miles of ground here in Staffordshire, and were to build upon it a neat city, consisting entirely of clean, comfortable little four-roomed houses, furnished in a simple style, with shops and so forth, but no public houses. Supposing, too, that he were to offer a house free to all the homeless folks, all the tramps and broken men, and out-of-workers in Great Britain. Then, having collected them together, let him employ them under fitting superintendence until some colossal piece of work which would last for many years and perhaps be of permanent value to humanity. Give them a good rate of pay, and let their hours of labor be reasonable, and those of recreation be pleasant. Might you not benefit them and benefit humanity at one stroke? But what form of work could you devise which would employ so vast a number for so long a time, and yet not compete with any existing industry? To do the latter would simply mean to shift the misery from one class to another. Precisely so. I should compete with no one. What I thought of doing was of sinking a shaft through the earth's crust and of establishing rapid communication with the antipodes. When you had got a certain distance down, 
how far is an interesting mathematical problem the centre of gravity would be beneath you presuming that your boring was not quite directly towards the centre and you could then lay down rails and tunnel as if you were on the level then for the first time it flashed into robert mcintyre's head that his father's chance words were correct and that he was in the presence of a madman his great wealth had clearly turned his brain and made him a monomaniac he nodded indulgently as when one humors a child it would be very nice he said i have heard however that the interiors of the earth is molten and your workmen would need to be salamanders the latest scientific data do not bear out the idea that the earth is so hot answered raffles haw it is certain that the increased temperature in coal mines depends upon the barometric pressure there are gases in the earth which may be ignited and there are combustible materials as we see in the volcanoes but if we came across anything of that sort in our borings we could turn a river or two down the shaft and get the better of it in that fashion it would be rather awkward if the other end of your shaft came out under the pacific ocean said robert choking down his inclination to laugh i have had estimates and calculations from the first living engineers french english and american the point of exit of the tunnel could be calculated to the yard. That portfolio in the corner is full of sections, plans, and diagrams. I have agents employed in buying up land, and if all goes well, we may get to work in the autumn. That is one device which may produce results. Another is canal cutting. Ah, there you would compete with the railways. You don't quite understand. I intend to cut canals through every neck of land where such a convenience could facilitate commerce. Such a scheme, were unaccompanied by any toll upon vessels, would, I think, be a very judicious way of helping the human race. And where, pray, would you cut the canals? asked Robert. I have a map of the world here, Ha answered, rising and taking one down from the paper rack. You see the blue pencil marks? Those are the points which I purpose to establish communication. Of course, I should begin by the obvious duty of finishing the Panama business. Naturally. The man's lunacy was becoming more and more obvious, and yet there was such precision and coolness in his manner that Robert found himself, against his own reason, endorsing and speculating over his plans. The Isthmus of Corinth also occurs to me. That, however, is a small matter of either a financial or an engineering point of view. I propose, however, to make a junction here, through Kiel between the German Ocean and the Baltic, it saves, you will observe, the whole journey round the coast of Denmark, and would facilitate our trade with Germany and Russia. Another very obvious improvement is to join the Forth and the Clyde, as to connect the Leith with the Irish and American routes. You see the blue line? Quite so. And we will have a little cutting here. It will run from Uleborg to Kem, and it will connect the White Sea with the Gulf of Bothnia. We must not allow our sympathies to be insular, must we? Our little charity should be cosmopolitan. We will try and give the good people of Archangel a better outlet for their furs and their tallow. But it will freeze. For six months in the year, still it will be something. Then we must do something for the East. It would never do to overlook the East. It would certainly be an oversight, said Robert, who was keenly alive to the comical side of the question. Raffles Haw, however, in deadly earnest, sat scratching away at his map with his blue pencil. Here is a point where we might be of some little use. If we cut through from Batome to the Kuro River, we might tap the trade of the Caspian and open up communication with all the rivers which run into it. You notice that they include a considerable tract of country. Then, again, I think that we might venture upon a little cutting between Beirut on the Mediterranean and the upper waters of the Euphrates, which would lead us into the Persian Gulf. Those are one or two of the more obvious canals which might knit the human race into a closer hole. Your plans are certainly stupendous, said Robert, uncertain whether to laugh or to be awestruck. You will cease to be a man and become one of the great forces of nature, altering, molding, and improving. This is precisely the view which I take of myself. This is why I feel my responsibility so acutely. But surely, if you do all this, you may rest. It is a considerable program. Not at all. I am a patriotic Briton, and I should like to do something to leave my name in the annals of my country. I should prefer, however, to do it after my own death, as anything in the shape of publicity and honor is very offensive to me. I have therefore put by eight hundred million in a place which shall be duly mentioned in my will, which I propose to devote to paying off the national debt. 
I cannot see that any harm would arise from its extinction. Robert sat staring, struck dumb by the audacity of the strange man's words. Then there is the heating of the soil. There is room for improvement there. You have no doubt read of the immense yields which have resulted in Jersey and elsewhere from the running of hot water pipes th through the soil. The crops are trebled and quadrupled. I would propose to try the experiment upon a larger scale. We might possibly reserve the Isle of Man to serve as a pumping and heating station. The main pipes would run to England, Ireland, and Scotland, and they would subdivide rapidly until they formed a network two feet deep under the whole country. A pipe at a distance of a yard would suffice for every purpose. I'm afraid, suggested Robert, that the water which left the Isle of Man warm might lose a little of its virtue before it reaches the case of this, for example. There need not be any difficulty here. Every few miles a furnace might be arranged to keep up the temperature. These are a few of my plans for the future, Robert, and I shall want the cooperation of disinterested men like yourself in all of them. But how brightly the sun shines, and how sweet the countryside looks! The world is very beautiful, and I should like to leave it happier than I found it. Let us walk together, Robert, and you will tell me of any fresh cases where I may be of assistance. End of chapter 8